recording started. Welcome to week 752 of our uh, Massive Open Online course, Change 11. As uh, I've stated to a few folks previously, I'm learning a lot about these open online courses and to a degree that relates to uh, how not to run one in terms of length and duration. But uh, personally, I'm uh, very excited today to uh, be able to interact uh, with Bonnie Stewart. Uh, Bonnie is with the University of uh, Prince Edward Island. I had the privilege to, uh, first of all, share probably the world's largest donor with uh, Bonnie and uh, Dave and uh, Alec Koros actually a few months ago and of course meet their, their lovely children. Uh, Bonnie's and Dave's actually, Alec wasn't involved at all. And so it's an opportunity here to uh, get a better sense of identity, something that's been an undertone throughout the bulk of the conversation that we've had over the last 30 some odd weeks. Uh, Bonnie is very active in uh, the research space around identity and she's probably published more around open online courses than anyone I know of and her publications have made their way around the world almost, I guess. She's published in The Guardian, uh, Inside Higher Ed, uh, and of course not directly related to MOOCs, uh, but related to identity on the cloud issue uh, in Salon and a variety of other spaces. I also had the pleasure of working on a research project with her and Dave uh, back in 2010, I believe, around uh, that digital practice through MOOCs. So certainly if you want to hear about MOOCs and identity, Bonnie's probably one of the best people I can think of to chat with us on that. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. Welcome. Thank you, George. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be facilitating this week. It's really great to see so many people out there in the chat room. Hi. And this is very much intended to be a conversation. I'm a PhD student. I'm still at the thesis proposal development. Um, two of my committee are are here today, um, stage of my um, of my research. And so I am basically researching in the open and opening this up to conversation about what digital identities and subjectivities means. Um, the nice thing about digital identities is that if, if you're here in a MOOC, you probably have some sort of digital identity and so all of us have something to contribute today. And um, I I framed it when I did the video uh, that's on the blog post that went up this week. I talked about our digital identities as selves that are brought into being by the affordances and the practices of networks and social media platforms and their norms. And so basically, I wanted to start by getting some input from you guys. Uh, and since you've already been writing on the, the main slide, I'm going to move to this one and ask you to tell me in whatever kind of terms come up for you, who are you when you're online? I know that I'm a bunch of people, but uh, I have multiple ways of interacting online. I started as a blogger um, and actually as, as what sometimes gets called a mommy blogger about six years ago and I write about parented from an identity perspective and have been doing so. Did anything move on anybody's screen? You might want to do Bonnie. Yeah, okay. Okay, what you might want to do, just make sure you've got the little follow tab just to the left or the right of the button selected. I advanced this slide, but there's a little check mark that should make us follow you. Okay, show me what you're talking about, George. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's clicked. Okay, so, it should be fine. We'll follow along. So somebody to chocoholic? Rhizomatic retroartition? No idea. Lurker? I am myself. I've been um, asking this question on my blog for a couple of years now. Who are you? Trying to figure out, trying to find my way and stumble my way to a focus for this research. And uh, more often than not, anytime I ask the question, the answer that I get is I'm, I'm me online. I am the same person that I am in any other setting. What this conversation is intended to be about is to look at, given that we are ourselves, and given that for the most part um, we are multiple in, in most environments, what do the specifics of 
networks and technological platforms make available to us, how does that affect who we are in our environment? So I'm going to try to switch pages again here. This is really, this is really great. Pixels and brains, 21st century mom, Canadian Australian psychologist. <laughs> Hi, Quetta. Me with a different name. There we go. Authentic and open, even with pseudonym. I think that's a really important part. There's such a big difference between anonymity and pseudonymity online because pseudonymity ends up, it's very much an identity nonetheless that people can interact with in a coherent way. I'm going to try to change slides here and let me know if we move along, okay? Does anybody see something that says what interactions start your day? Nope, okay. I've clicked follow. I'd like to be able to sort this out. Do now, okay. Now advanced. Well, thanks for advancing, Dave. Hi, Trina. Um, what I'm interested in knowing, if you have your average day, how do you begin? Um, my research is practices focused, and so the philosophy underneath um, what I'm working with is that, in a sense, we, we make ourselves, we make identity deeply in part through practices. And um, when I get up, my day is often started by very small children. Um, I say hello to Dave. Uh, I say hello to my cat. I have coffee. Sometimes I shower. Uh, I open my laptop. The first place I tend to go on my computer is Twitter. Uh, occasionally my email account. It depends on what's going on. P. Good point. Coffee, coffee. This is great. Twitter on the phone. I interact with the body. Yeah. Actually, sometimes we, because we still have small children who sometimes interact with, well, with the bed, you know, who pee the bed very, very early in the morning. Sometimes our beds, or our, our mornings start a little too early on those terms. Yeah. What I'm noticing as this comes up is that I like checking in with current self. Are these Skype calls? Yeah. In many cases, people are blending what we sometimes call worlds. So people are mentioning coffee and email together. When I did my master's work back in the late 90s, I was looking at how technologies and knowledge end up being sort of mutually constitutive in a given time. And so I did a lot of work into digital identity back in the 90s before there were social networking platforms. And at that point, we were still talking a great deal about the virtual world and online as a virtual world. And one of the things that my work um, focuses on right now is, is the change from that concept of virtual world to something that's embedded and enmeshed so that we often, technology is simply one of the ways that facets of ourselves interact with the rest of our world. Um, that my embodied and physical self and the various selves that I am online are all interacting together. Is anybody drinking coffee in Second Life still? Yeah, Second Life ended up being sort of the, the peak of, of that concept of virtual world. And it's, it's very much not um, the focus that I'm looking at when I'm thinking about digital identities. I'm not thinking about an identity that is, is you on screen, but rather an identity that is your world in its full and multiple ways. So we've got a whole lot of mixing here. And for me, and I'm going to change slides now, so if this doesn't change and, and somebody could uh, push it forward for me, that's great. But my work focuses on the concept of the cyborg, and this comes from Donna Haraway. Um, or my particular use of it comes from Donna Haraway, and goes beyond the idea that cyborgs are connected to cybernetic feedback mechanisms. Um, this is a mechanical baby doll from uh, a patent from the 1800s. 
but Haraway uses the concept of the cyborg to explode binaries, to, to say that there, that there, um, there is no so-called real or natural organism that is separate from the artificial organism, but rather that we are all mixed together, we are all cyborg. Um, <clears throat> the virtual is a low-res mirror for helping us see or focus on the offline world. Yeah, sometimes it can. I believe that patent has expired. Um, I'm trying to get past the idea simply of the virtual and consider these worlds as embedded, and that's what the cyborg kind of lets me do, is um, take that binary of real and virtual and talk about them together. I'm going to move slides again. And one of the pieces that's been very important for me is thinking about social media versus social networks. Do you guys tend to make a distinction between them? It, it's fairly recent distinction in my own work. How do you guys see them? George thinks they are distinct. How do you think they're distinct, George? Tools, social media is tools. Networks are made up of people. Networks don't need social media to exist. Yeah, I have tended um, in a lot of my earlier posts, uh, I've used the word social media. And I think that that is partly because of how I came online. I used um, my blog initially as a place to speak. And it was the capacity to have um, a broad audience across space and to essentially broadcast, even to a tiny group of people, what I needed to say that was interesting to me. Um, social media does tend to put focus on tools and platforms, and that can be important. But the concept of social networks for me is connected to the idea of people. And if you see this picture here that I have on the right, under social networks, it has the person in the center connected to a whole bunch of people, but I also liked it as a representation for social networks because it's also an ad. And so when I'm thinking about affordances of social network working platforms particularly, um, one of the things that I'm considering is how the ways in which it's, these are being used in our culture are being taken up. And when we get down to talking about the cells, Later, um, one of the pieces that, that I'll bring in is that brand itself and in this culture where people are um, regularly and constantly using these as platforms for selling. So what it means to be an identity in this, these networks, which are also networks of, of capital and social capital and, um, and relationships. The key concept that I'm currently working with is Dana Boyd's idea of network publics. Um, and this is, this is a visual representation, actually, that Dave Cormier had made a couple of years ago of his own Facebook networks. And if you see the large pink spot in the middle, uh, that's me. Uh, because I end up being embedded and connected to a whole bunch of people um, that he is. These are the different sectors of his life. And these are the ways that I happen to, to fit within those. To me, <laughs> not the lack of attribution on the slide, sending Lou asks a really good question. Where is Dave? Dave is not represented in this picture. This is a picture of essentially, I guess, Dave's view of the world um, as captured by his, his Facebook 2009 version um, world. I don't like to have the word breakfast without using the word affordances either, Lisa. Um, does everybody know what the word affordances means? I think that George can probably explain it a whole lot better than I am, but affordances are basically the, the, the enabling factors of 
of the structures that we use, the action potential of the tool, says George. Um, to me, it's, it's what tech makes possible, not just in terms of action, but the agencies and the identity and the relationality of all of those things. Um, one of the key affordances of social networks and digital technologies in general is the idea, it's called producers, it's called prosumer relationships, that we are <laughs> Don't say some of my friends are tools. Thank you, Nancy. Um, that we are both creators and consumers within these uh, within these spaces. And so, in a networked public, one of the big differences um, than seeing the world as an individual. Um, so you have the the discrete subject of sort of 19th and 20th century conceptions of self. Um, and then the groups that exist in, in the often hierarchical structures that were organized to coordinate groups at that time, the network operates differently, partly because of the actions available to people within it. And technologies are, and, and sort of the properties of bits, are the reason for the differences in those actions available. I sometimes think of the, the network public as the panopticon, uh, the, the famous Bentham picture of the prison where you can see everybody but with benefits, with, with, with side benefits. And, and that difference connects to, um, in a sense, Foucault's concept of the disciplinary society uh, versus Deleuze's concept of the control society. So rather than uh, being able to see uh, in, a, in a prison sense, right? So you have a prison guard view of the world where you can see everyone for, for the purposes of, of controlling um, behaviors. In the loser's control society, everybody has a certain amount of, of capacity to view, but they are, we are self-controlling. Um, we're like the, the colonized mind. We see ourselves reflected by others and then we uh, moderate and mitigate our own behaviors uh, to be acceptable within that sort of panopticon view. This old-fashioned panopticon is a many, uh, sort of a one-to-many view of the world. And one of the big changes that interests me in terms of network publics is that um, the ways that produces that um, the creator-consumer model of identity so that I am both putting stuff out into the world and also uh, reading the stuff that the people who are in my networks put out, um, that, changes, um, that, that changes my relationship. It, it makes it much more pure focused. And I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the chat room. Friendships, friends aren't affordances because they're not actions. Yeah, I would say that. But if this is a relational view of the world, then I don't, I don't know. How does that fit? So in thinking about identity within sort of the, the peer to peer panopticon, <laughs> um, I want to know about your practices. I'm interested in what you guys do that fits within that producage model, that sharing with your networks. What do you share of yourself? Um, and you know, what do you consume of, of that of other people? Sandy, no, I don't think networks are technologies. Um, networks are in fact, networks are definitely not solely technologies um, because networks have existed long, long before the particular types of technologies we're talking about. They're relational. Um, the technologies create the capacity to build new types of relationships. And yes, Latour, George would, would say that the technologies are in those relationships as well. I try to sell myself. Stuff. 
stuff I make for my students. I share my world of ideas. <laughs> my wife thinks I share too much, but basically I don't know what I think until I share it. I try to I try to sell myself to community practice. The mix of language in here is very interesting. How many of you are more comfortable with sharing versus selling as language for what you're doing? Yeah, I hate sell. And when we get into talking about these particular cells and nah, yeah, branding language freaks me out. I share professional info that could be useful to others. Not much. Do you find value in sharing? Yes. So I'm grappling with all these ideas of what it means to share ourselves or in some cases sell things or ourselves um, across networks that are broader than ones that we may have had capacity to access in, in previous times. Um, and sharing stories definitely is how some of us learn. I am when I, when I sat down to look at this week, what I wanted to do was try to find ways of talking about identity that helped make visible some of the affordances that technologies make available um, to identity within networked publics. And so I took six ideas. I, I could have taken it. Dave, can you advance the slide? Um, I could have taken 70. I have the seven dwarfs here because I kind of wanted to point out that I realized that the six is by no means definitive and that really they're not separate selves, that they are more facets of self. However, as much as they're embedded together, um, some of us have particularly strong reactions or resonance with certain ones and not with others. And so I'm interested. Uh, <laughs> No, it, it's, a, it's a Creative Commons slide, uh, Stephen. Um, but just some of us may recognize ourselves more in certain ones of these. And I'm interested in what kinds of practices bring these particular pieces forward. Daniel, you are totally Snow White, but you're not in the picture. Um, and when I'm talking about these, I do not mean in any way to suggest that the different selves are even truly separable, but rather separating them enables conversation about particular aspects of the affordances. Can you advance the slide, Dave? So the first one that's, that's really interesting for me is performativity. And a lot of my um, reading last year was sort of coming to terms with the performative term in uh, social science theory. Um, and the concepts of Judith Butler, Karen Barad, and, and work like that. And performative, Lisa, you say it's a new word for you. To be performative, essentially performative acts are speech acts that bring into being uh, the thing that they say in the doing. So if I say, uh, I now pronounce you man and wife, if I am vested to make that pronouncement, then um, as <clears throat> archaic and patriarchal as it may be, uh, there are ways in which it is made true by, by, the, by the doing. Um, basically, performativity is the power of discourses to produce and regulate what they speak, what they bring into being. And performative concepts of self take on the idea of the authentic self. Again, that they they displace that notion of the yes, it is, it does come from Austin originally. The speech act stuff comes from Austin, Stephen, and then you have um, 
Goffman doing work in the 50s around performativity, and then you move into some of the late 90s. To, no, it's not solely based on, on discourse. Um, Lisa, particularly more recent stuff on performativity, work by Karen Barad suggests that we can actually look at the performativity of um, matter. And so it, it takes the it, some of it takes the idea of discourse as uh, what is brought into being around us. But basically, it takes on the idea of to thine own self be true, right? That notion that there is a real authentic self inside, and instead that by repetitive actions, we bring into being particular concepts of ourselves. So a network public is, is almost inherently, I think, dependent on some notion of performativity, that we are acting, um, not in a false way, but acting for an audience at all times. I mentioned earlier when my cat popped up, you know, the, the old internet, uh, early internet meme on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? That was the 1990s concept of digital identity. Um, if I were to try to enact myself as a dog on the internet, eventually there would be problems there because people do not have a social concept of a dog as being able to communicate in human ways. <laughs> Hi, Cog Dog. <laughs> uh, but if I write on the internet and begin to perform as a writer, share my work as a writer, be taken up as a writer, um, eventually I become a writer and that becomes part of my identity. So the idea that we are certainly, um, it has a material and semiotic um, connection both, that I am tied to some extent to who I am. <laughs> we, we do have a, 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 counter, a counter example in Cog Dog. Um, but that I'm tied to who I am here in this body and at the same time I can make whole new aspects of self. Um, so there's, there's the performative self was one of the ones that I think is an important part of considering who we are in online spaces. Can you click to the next one, Dave? I'm not able to click it. Thank you. The quantified self. One of the pieces that um, many of us struggle with, and I think in some ways these different selves bring out uh, some of our ideological and, and theoretical tendencies um, and comfort zones. So often, if where people are comfortable with the idea of performativity, they may not be so comfortable with the idea of the quantified self. By articulated um, in a social network, in, a, in, in networked publics, we can always see who people's friends are. I, when I walk around in my small town, I don't have a list tattooed on my back of who all my cousins are and who I went to grade seven with and all of those things. On Facebook, for instance, if you friend me, you can see visibly who I am. If you go, or well, who I'm connected to. If you go to my Twitter account, you can see who I follow. You can see who follows me. Um, and you take that to another um, level and you look at, at tools like Clout, which then have algorithms that assess those. They assess not just who follows me and who clicks the links that I put out, but also how um, big, what the scale and reach of those particular identities is. And they calculate all that together to then put forth this number to say, this is Bonnie Stewart and she's a 59 out of 100. Justin Bieber is the only person on cloud who has a hundred, um, by the way, and I, I am always hesitant about any kind of model that has Justin Bieber as its ultimate performance of identity. I'm no Bieber, um, but I do think my clout is higher than your estate, so <clears throat> just saying. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
sort of a, that that sort of and you can kill your cloud account. That was new when there was a big outcry last year because they changed the algorithm. But one of the interesting things about clout, uh, and one of the things that makes for interesting investigation, is that um, it basically caps out at about in the 60s, maybe the high 60s, if you are not essentially a celebrity. So it favors people who are visible in the public eye and it raises interesting questions about this notion of the network public because in some ways there is a, a celebrity-like quality to gaining any kind of visibility in a networked public. People start to know you that you don't know in return. Um, and Keith, if you want to know your clout score, you because it exists unless you've killed your account, basically. So if you're on Twitter um, and if you're on Facebook, then you do have a clout score, whether or not you know what it is, unless you have actively gone to close it out. And it does say that famous people have influence, um, but it also, because of the ways that clout can be taken up, um, it, it privileges things like the numbers of people who know your name necessarily over things like the quality of work you do or if you are in a small um, field and you know then you're only going to get shown out. Celebrity definitely does give more power in, in this world. Um, so this sort of quantified self is, is interesting. And yes, is it close tag or close tag? Does anybody know? Klosfrag and Klosfrag, and I think that uh, it may have been Jen Ingenuity who um, created Lush, Lush, uh, an alternate, or your Lout score or something like that last year. So there, there are a variety of parody accounts of Clout um, that judge, you know, how people are performing in online spaces and sort of turn the um, the idea of quantifying our actions into a joke, but yes, basically we, we are quantified and whether we want to be quantified or not, um, those measurements exist and this is where we get into particularly educationally concepts like learning analytics and, and where does, where do our numbers and our data trails take us um, and what do they say about us and how much do we even know about those things. Um, yeah, rate your doctor, rate your professor.com, all of those things, right? We are, we are open. Um, I'm going to switch slides, Dave. Can you go forward, please? The participatory self. This is uh, this slide is actually just screen captures of a chat a month or so ago, um, largely within my blogging community. So narrative bloggers, for the most part, talking about why we write. But the interesting thing for me. In some ways, uh, the participatory self, when I started sort of separating all, all of these selves off um, and realizing, again, that they are only placeholders for having discussions around affordances, um, a number of you in the comments to my blog post this week mentioned how being reflected by your networks is one of the key pieces for you. And I would say that the participatory self definitely um, encompasses some of that, that reflectiveness, the reflexivity. This is very much not the, the one-to-many system, um, but the, the capacity to connect with others. So when I think about my participatory self, I think about my agency to go out and engage with what people are doing in an iterative fashion. One of the affordances that's important in the participatory self is, um, oh, sorry, I got distracted by the, <laughs> I keep getting distracted by the, um, by the chat room. Um, this is where we get back into the, the, the non-individual book group, and this is where hierarchy gets challenged. So educationally, the participatory self is particularly interesting because rather than the old paper model of I would like you to write a paper and when it is finished it will be printed out as an artifact that is unchangeable and therefore it needs to be fully edited and perfect and all of those things and then it is done. I think that the participatory self speaks to a more ongoing concept of 
of work um, and to um, to also the, the capacity to push into what other people are doing in a way that if you're writing a book and I can only see it once it's done and published and I'm purchasing it, then that's very different than if you're writing your book as a series of blog posts and I'm constantly commenting and engaging. And increasingly, I think that there is a preference um, among people who do engage and who do have sort of digital identities for that type of capacity. And it's something that particularly those of us in education possibly need to be, be thinking about. Um, quick forward date, please. In the long run, we're defined by the artifacts we produce. That's true, um, but what about the capacity to, to interact with other people's artifacts and have them be sort of more of a collective and collaborative artifact rather than that discrete individual artifact? I am trying to push this forward. Dave, can you click the slide forward? Oh, I can't click the slide forward. Um, now I've lost the slides completely. Dave, uh, we're what asynchronous? Is? Yeah, I'm not, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm, I'm asynchronous here. Um, okay, there we go. Um, one of the other selves that, that I thought was interesting was the asynchronous self. And I mentioned in my blog post that, <laughs> yeah, I, th I think this is probably me, Lisa, that I'm not super familiar with uh, doing this. And I, I've got something going on where this is clipped so that you guys should be able to see when I put the slides forward, but it isn't happening. <laughs> so um, for me, the asynchronous self is, is probably best captured by my relationship to the telephone. Um, I have, you know, a, a preference for asynchronous communications when they're mediated. Now, to me, this, this has a lot to do with the agency to prioritize and see my communications in terms of networks. I work from home. Um, I have a family member who is also at home during the day and likes to call. And I happen to work on my couch a lot where I'm still stuck with a, a very old phone where the call display doesn't work and I make the mistake of answering it occasionally because I wouldn't want to miss a call from you know, my bank finding out if um, I'm enjoying my service again. Uh, but I make the mistake of answering it. And then I end up stuck on my couch on a non-portable phone trying to politely extricate myself from a conversation from somebody who seems to just want to call to chat. They would never do this if I was working in an office. Um, but because I work from home, the assumption that I am available to have personal conversations um, is something that I haven't fully managed to, to navigate relationally in that relationship. Um, and to me, the asynchronous self speaks about the blurring of the personal and professional. Um, it raises questions about um, mobility, about you know, we are asynchronous. Um, we would prefer to have the choice to communicate unless there's an emergency, um, in which case I think most of us will always kind of jump in. Um, yeah. Yeah, the latent sexism of, of, of what it means to be at home. I think it raises a lot of questions around domestic spheres and public spheres. And again, the, that blurring of the professional and personal occurs within the breakdown of some hierarchical and institutional ways of being that structured our lives. So there was a time when you couldn't contact somebody if they were at school. Um, and if they were at work, they were expected to answer their phone, but you would never call just to chat with them. Um, and now, those things are all meshed together and our relationships haven't necessarily fully caught up with, um, or different people within our networks haven't maybe fully caught up to, to how to navigate that. Um, within, that within the asynchronous self too is one other point around persistence of, of memory. Um, 
certainly within personal networks, there are always people who remember your younger embarrassing self. Uh, I think one of mine is here in the chat today, who isn't Dave, hi Trina. Uh, but there is now that capacity for artifacts of ourselves um, or of our performed lives to, to carry on throughout time. And sometimes, particularly within networks, and Dana Boyd talks about this in the article about network publics that's linked on the blog post, um, both in terms of reach and in terms of persistence, uh, things that we don't intend to become identifying aspects of our selves to other people will take off. So people end up becoming an internet meme without intending to. And that can follow them for years if it reaches far enough, um, if it reaches out and scale far enough. And so you can end up being sort of traced uh, by things that, that you never intended to be part of your visible or public identity. And this is where we get into the, the concept of digital identity as identity management, which is one of the main ways in which it's talked about culturally. Uh, Dave, can we move slides? Now, the enmeshed self. This one is probably the most complicated and at the same time, it, it, augmented reality is essentially the idea that our um, physical worlds are embedded in, within and enmeshed with our digital worlds, that atoms and bytes collide and are mixed and are navigated together. This um, cartoon sort of points out that we've actually always been networked and now we are simply pulling these two things together. In my comments, a couple of people had noted that they saw this augmented or polysocial reality as reflecting the Second Life virtual concept. For me, it doesn't. In my work, it doesn't. It's actually one of the more basic premises. It's just that when you are sitting in your chair on Facebook, you are also sitting in your chair, but you can be talking to people who are halfway across the world. And that, the, that both things work together and the affordances of both impact each other. Um, it is the... Yeah, people don't, don't see they're doing the same thing in real life, it's true. I think that one of the, the most difficult pieces for me in terms of, of this concept is how to talk about it in a way that makes sense because most people who are online at all are living it to some extent, but I don't think that we've culturally come up with a great way of speaking about it. And so if anybody has suggestions for how to speak about it, I would be very happy to hear them. Um, the work on augmented reality, there's a lot of great stuff at the Cyborgology blog on this. And the polysocial reality concept, which is, is similar, um, is, is linked on my blog post. One more self, Dave. And the last one is the brand itself. And this is the one that is, thanks Dave, this is the one that's probably the most touchy for a lot of people. My premise is that because social networks and social media are so increasingly being used uh, for business purposes that the discourses of business and neoliberalism of sell yourself, of how to put yourself out there um, are so dominant in these spaces. When I go online, I can avoid basically conversations about how to find your niche and how to maximize your network potential and, and all of those things. And that those, we get so many of those messages that we begin to see ourselves in that environment and in those terms. And then we begin to, to some extent, adapt, adopt the practices and adapt ourselves to the practices um, of of, of neoliberalism and, and of selling ourselves. And yet there are some pretty horrible things happening with this in education. I think there's a further and maybe maybe separate um, push to, to have education become entirely business um, and so that we are very much having to sell public education. 
but even at the identity level, how are we interacting with our networks in ways that um, that maximize us? And when we when we start to focus on things, particularly the quantified self, right? So if you start to think about yourself in terms of your club score, then you start to probably at least begin to consider what practices might make that go up. The branding, um, I, I think Nancy asks what's the relationship between reputation and the idea of branding. For myself, I don't see them as terribly different, except that branding tends to imply the capacity to sell, and often those of us who come out of education and more arts-based backgrounds are, are less comfortable with the language of selling. Um, but we represent these, these, you know, public identities that people can take up as a brand. If you start talking about things that you don't normally talk about, people will respond um, in ways, in social ways, that are very similar to the, what, what in business language is, is termed going off brand. So because business has become social, to some extent, there's been this incursion, incursion of, um, of the opposite, of, of um, business has come into the social and social has, has gone into business. Can we slide ahead, Dave? And so when you take those six things, and this is, those are just kind of to cover some of those different affordances, but when I think about these things, these digital selves, what types of learning experiences foster or limit digital selves? And this is um, a picture, it's a Banksy um, piece of performance art, um, a tiger escaping the branded cage, I suppose. Um, but I think about education and I think about things like the MOOC and particularly watching MOOCs become um, a big university whole, yeah, I would say that that Banksy stuff is very much performance art. Um, so watching things like edX come out and they are taking what I see as um, some of the affordances of digital technologies and almost putting them back into an institutional hierarchical box where instead of encouraging connections between um, people who are, are learning together in an environment, like the, the conversation that's happening here uh, in the chat room. Instead, they focus on performing for the instructor and they focus on um, you know, quantifying uh, information. And, and so I'm, I'm concerned and, and, and sort of interested to see where all this goes. The, the slide that I wanted to, to move to, Dave, this one is, I was wondering about retrospectively these different identities and these different aspects of identity. Um, how have they been part of your Change 11 experience and what have you valued about um, being in this or, you know, working in this, participating in this, moving in and out of this experience? of learning this way, to me, these types of connectivist MOOCs foster um, our, our network connection. They're very much acting within a network public. We are performing for each other, we are communicating with each other, um, and we are, are learning from each other. And so I'm interested in, in what's come out for you here in this experience. No, uh, uh, Stephen says not all art is performance. No, it's not. Um, but Banksy's work tends to be. How does the, the lack of a credential in this type of course 
affect you on an identity level. To me, it's one of the places, from my own personal experience, where it it gives and it takes, right? I, I prefer this because I don't happen to be in need of a credential from this experience. I'm already involved in an organized credentialed PhD program. Um, but this offers me a whole different type of experience that is much more network focused, that allows me a type of public performance, um, and that allows me to move in and out when I can without worrying about externalizing my learning. Right? It, it's what I take out of it is what I take out of it, and for me that's great. Um, now some people are in need of a credential and so that there are limitations. Would you value more quantification from this experience? Like, I mean, I don't think that, for instance, the um, this MOOC has particularly, unless you've set up things for for your own, on your own, um, that has given you a sense of how much you participated, or you know, do we do we need the quantified self in this? How do we? foster more of the participatory self, perhaps. Yeah, somebody points out, I think it's easy for those of us with qualifications to be okay. I think the credentialing conversation is, is a messy one because as much as most of us, um, you know, particularly in education, don't want to look at education as existing for credentialing, there is privilege um, in being connected to a credentialed system. And so for those who are looking for ways to perform identity in a world that values credentialing, if we totally dismiss it um, without recognizing that many of us have access that, that others may not um, to institutional credentialing, then, then we may be leaving stuff out. Yeah, this may not play out for another generation. I am change 11 and part of it. That room scads. We are quieter. Do you think we're quiet? Whoever said we're quieter, um, because we don't have to regurgitate what we're learning or Yeah. One of the interesting things, <laughs> um, one of the interesting things is is that point that Verena is making in the chat room about I'm not a scholar, but I still have a voice. I'm not worried about or needing credentials. Um, I like the way that this type of course does open up the community, the, the scholarly community, for different kinds of participation. And I'm still not sure that I understand all of the affordances of what we're doing. Um, but yes, I, I would say that even those of us who are not acknowledged scholars get to think and act as scholars, and that's where the concept of performativity, this gives us a network in which we can do that. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. And in terms of the identities, there, the six that I chose were simply some of the affordances that I happen to be looking at. Um, people have suggested collective um, identities, and I'm just wondering whether I, I was thinking myself about the concept of distributed identity that again, challenges that idea of the discrete individual, the special unique snowflake who acts in a fully independent and unified manner. Um, what other kinds of identities do you guys see as important in thinking about the affordances of network technologies on who we are? participatory culture is it? Ah, the personality stuff. Yeah, how, how individual personalities may affect this. I mean, in that sense, you've got a, a 
a psychological discourse of personality may be coming up against a much more sociological, societal discourse of, of networks. Um, the notion of authenticity. Authenticity is such a messy word online. Um, in blogging, it, it keeps it keeps popping up, and it's it's dangerous um, because I think that we all recognize um, certain types of inauthenticity. And for for me, it comes down again to that concept that I mentioned of the material semiotic, where you can there there are limitations on the identities that I can perform and be taken up as authentic. Um, and they're based often in, in my materiality. Um, but I'm not sure that, that that's complete either. Yeah, we're pretty much done, Dave. Um, if you can slide through to the next slide, if people are done with this one. We've got some rain clouds. Jog, let me say. One last slide basically is, is just th thank you for, for letting me talk all of this through. Um, if you're interested in looking further, uh, my blog is here. Feel free to talk to me on Twitter. But most important is actually the, the Mendeley group. Um, I'm trying to put together a, a group on Mendeley of people who are interested in this stuff and just collecting resources. So if you have stuff to contribute uh, that you think I should be reading for this research, I would very much appreciate if you could uh, join the group and, and throw links in at me. And it's, I'm looking forward to uh, reading through this chat room a little bit better and uh, seeing what comes out of this. So thank you very much for the conversation. Have a great day. Well, thanks, Bonnie. I'll just uh, pop in here and uh, do a wrap up of the session. Um, I think some uh, the topic of uh, identity is one of those things that you know only seems to grow more and more important as we start to spend greater periods of time in you know in online settings and as we start to recognize that the way in which you sit at a different uh, context or different uh, settings at least helps us to start to rethink the roles that we have and whether there's you know the power aspect of it are we more or less equitable in online settings uh, than we are at face-to-face -face settings and if so to what degree and how does uh, power and influence change I and mean, these are questions that you get with a large group of individuals politically and otherwise as well trying to work through what does the identity mean and how does that transfer you know we understand the influence to varying degree of traditional media, but we don't quite understand what the influence is yet as we move more and more to digital settings. So uh, we've seen little outcroppings of it when we have election cycles or when there's a you know some kind of explosion politically or otherwise, mm -hmm. so definitely some big challenges. And uh, the topic of, of identity and the way we express ourselves in those areas is going to become, I think, more and more important as we go forward. So certainly your research and the focus on your talk is, is uh, increasingly relevant. So for the, the rest of you, thanks very much for, for joining us. I will at this point kill the recording.